Ilica actually comes from the Greek word for materials, uh, and that's really the foundation of the business. What we're best known for is our solid state battery technology, um, which we call our Stereax technology, which actually comes from the Greek word for solid, because our batteries are solid state batteries, and we're gonna talk a bit about that as we go through the presentation. Uh, and that is really born out of the technology platform, which is all about the high throughput development of new materials for a series of sectors that we're going to dip into. So uh, there you see the overview of our organization's activities. You see the majority is actually focused on solid state batteries, uh, but also we have some sector activity in aerospace alloys, some in electronics, and some in energy materials, in particular, general battery technology. And we're gonna talk a bit about the detail of those programs in the next few slides. So our business model is shamelessly stolen from the ARM business model, which has been successfully rolled out in this country in the semiconductor industry. In fact, our chairman, Mike Ingalls, was the commercial director at ARM for many years and guided them through that fantastic growth period that I'm sure many of you as investors have benefited from. Where we are as an organization is that we are currently recognizing revenue from development contracts which are at the front end of that business model. The company is at the phase where it's flipping into licensing income, which we're going to layer on top of that development revenue foundation. And then in due course, when the products that uh, incorporate our solid state batteries get to market, we will enjoy a second layer of uh, royalty revenue on top of that licensing income. So some of you actually I recognize from the audience have been down to visit our facility in Southampton. And this is what you'll have seen down there. This is our high throughput materials development rig. And this is actually a rig that is designed to be able to make systematically varying arrays of materials across single substrates. So it's actually derived from semiconductor technology. If you've been to a Motorola fabrication line or perhaps been lucky enough to see an Intel factory, then you would have seen technology very similar to this. The difference is instead of making millions of silicon chips exactly the same, we make arrays of materials. So you see that chip at the bottom right of the slide there, that's got a hundred contacts in the center of it. And on each one of those contacts, you've got a slightly different material that we've deposited simultaneously with the rest of the materials on that chip. And then we plug that into some electronics that tell us whether the materials are useful for the application or not. So it's a way of accelerating materials development. In terms of the programs that we run, all of these programs are actually done in partnership with much larger companies than ourselves. And that's because we like to have a clear route to market for the materials that we develop. The idea is that we innovate the materials, they get incorporated into the products that our partners are developing, and they then take those products to market and we benefit from the licensing stream. So at the top you see some uh, projects related to the development of energy materials. The first one is with Johnson Matthey. You can't really ignore them. They are this country's largest materials manufacturer. Um, they've in recent years started venturing away from the precious metals business, uh, which is really their corporate heritage, more towards uh, the battery industry, which they see as a big growth opportunity. And we're working with them on a type of batteries called lithium sulfur batteries, um, which are actually lighter weight uh, versions of the lithium ion concept, which actually have a, um, uh, a slightly larger volume and have some technological barriers that they still need to overcome, but nevertheless are one of the future technologies that will become increasingly important in years to come. <clears throat> we also are working together with Toyota, and Toyota is a long-standing relationship that we've had over about the last eight years uh, the, this latest um, program relates uh, to the development of new materials in combination with what Toyota are calling artificial intelligence. 
Now, we just had our half year results a couple of weeks ago, and I went around the institutional investors, uh, and one of them said, well, no presentation is complete without a slide mentioning AI. Well, this is ours. Uh, AI is actually nothing more than a feedback loop between a model and reality. Uh, so effectively, we're training their computer models and their predictive methods of being able to identify which materials are going to be useful for the applications they're interested in. So they're interested in batteries uh, for their uh, hybrid and their electric vehicles of the future. They're predicting materials that could be useful. Uh, we're actually making them and testing them, and we're giving them all of that data to plug back into their model to try and improve the uh, accuracy and reliability of the predictions that their models make. In aerospace, uh, we work on two programs. One of them is with uh, BAE Systems and with GKN, and that's all about self-healing alloys, which is a class of alloys which, instead of fracturing under strain, have the ability to realign their grain structure to absorb that strain and actually give you a much longer component lifetime. So that's particularly interesting for, say, the mountings of wings uh, and also landing gear, where it's important to make sure that these components uh, are, are uh, reliable and uh, don't give you any serious surprises just at the moment when it's critical. Um, we're also working uh, with Rolls-Royce on super alloys, and these are the alloys that go into jet engines. In fact, not the iconic uh, single crystal turbine blades, but in fact the expansion discs in the center of jet engines where the combustion gases are being expanded out of the exhaust of the engine. And these are really demanding environments, high stress, high temperature, and our method is really good for identifying um, potential materials of the future. Uh, then we've got electronics. This is perhaps our biggest relationship in the electronics field. This is with Seagate. Um, they have a big manufacturing plant in Northern Ireland, in Derry. And we work together with them to come up with what they call their hammer technology, which is heat-assisted magnetic recording, um, which really is all about increasing the density of data storage on hard drives that go into server farms. And this is where all of the data that's processed on the internet is effectively stored. And these guys are trying to stay ahead of their nearest competitor, which is Western Digital. And in order to do that, they need improved photonic materials, in fact, 2D materials. And that's what we're screening with that high throughput platform that you saw on the previous slide. So let's change gear. Let's talk about solid state batteries. Um, the head of the electric drivetrain group at BMW was quoted in the FT just a couple of weeks ago in the same article in which Illica was mentioned, saying that if solid state batteries existed now uh, in, on a scale that could be used in electric vehicles, then everybody would be using them. So why did he say that? He said that for a number of reasons. Uh, the first one, which isn't on this slide actually, is that uh, they're non-flammable. And that was the reason that Toyota came to us about eight years ago and started getting us screening materials that could be used for the solid state electrolyte in a battery. So batteries are really simple devices. Uh, they've got two electrodes. One of them is the cathode, uh, which is usually some sort of structured material containing lithium. So examples are NMC or LFP. You might have read some of these acronyms. And then on the other side of the cell, you've got the anode, which is typically a carbon material, sometimes mixed with other materials like silicon, uh, into which the lithium ions can migrate when you charge the battery. And the bit in the middle is a liquid electrolyte, which is actually the medium through which the lithium ions can migrate, and a polymer separator to stop the battery from shorting. And the idea with a solid state battery is that you do away with the liquid electrolyte and the polymer membrane, and you replace that with an ionically conductive but electrically insulating ceramic, which allows you to actually make a much more compact battery, which is totally non-flammable. The other advantages of this architecture are that you get a much lower leakage current. And what that means is that the battery doesn't go flat on its own. It holds its charge. Um, the other advantage is that typically they've got a longer 
lifespan because uh, the problem with using a liquid electrolyte is that over time, the liquid electrolyte, which is typically an organic solvent, tends to degrade and it leaves waste products on the interface between the electrodes and the electrolyte, which causes a large internal resistance in the cell. And so that's why we get fed up with our mobile phones eventually uh, and want to change because actually the battery doesn't hold as much charge. Then the other advantage of solid state batteries is that they're much more compact. They're about half the size, sort of order of magnitude, relative to a normal lithium ion battery. And in applications like automotive, that's really important because effectively you want as much space as possible for your passengers and your luggage, and you don't really want to be sitting on a massive mound of batteries, which is what some of the uh, electric vehicle designs currently look like. Um, other sort of differentiators of our own technology relative to competitive solid state technologies are that actually we've managed to improve the energy footprint of our cells relative to, let's call them traditional solid state designs. We can also go up to 100 degrees C and this high temperature performance of solid state is really interesting because actually a normal lithium ion battery will start to swell above 60 degrees C and then you will get a runaway thermal reaction above 140 degrees C which has caused some of the spectacular images that we saw with the launch of the Dreamliner and some of the other lithium ion uh, technologies that are out there. And then also we don't have any free lithium uh, in the cells and what that means is that actually we don't have a, a lithium anode so some of the solid state designs uh, have put in a, a lithium anode which gives you a really nice uh, cell voltage about a four volt steady cell voltage but the problem is that actually lithium is flammable and if you manage to puncture those cells then you've, you've got a bit of a problem on your hands. So uh, what are the markets that we're interested in selling these cells into? Uh, first of all, we're interested in batteries for uh, wireless networks. So some people refer to this as the Internet of Things. There are currently about 15 billion sensors already deployed on the planet. Most of those are hardwired and uh, most of the analysts who are covering this sector are predicting that the growth for IoT will come from wireless sensors that can be deployed in a much more flexible manner than the sensors, for instance, that are integrated into our mobile phones or perhaps into your vehicles. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, challenges that need to be overcome in order to achieve that wireless deployment. And certainly solid state batteries offer some of those solutions. The sectors in which we're finding uptake at the minute uh, are shown here. First of all, medical. Uh, there's a big uh, demand for uh, compact batteries to go into medical implants uh, because, of course, uh, those devices need to be reliable. Ideally, they haven't got any cables associated with them and you need to be able to leave them there for a number of years. Um, also, transport. So, uh, you know, the big challenge at the moment with the development of increasingly autonomous vehicles is that the number of sensors that are going in there is causing a massive increase in the weight of cabling to the point where uh, cabling has become the third heaviest component in a car behind the engine and the chassis. And as you move from the hundred sensors that we're getting in a modern car at the minute towards a thousand sensors in a fully autonomous vehicle, then you can't afford to have 600 kilograms of copper cabling in the vehicle. And so wireless solutions like, for instance, the TPMS or tire pressure monitoring sensor that goes into some vehicles, uh, increasingly mainstream vehicles, actually, it's not only luxury cars that have tire pressure monitoring sensors now. Um, if you can take that technology, you can overcome some of those weight challenges. Um, Industry, I think it's obvious you don't want to be running long cables to relatively inaccessible uh, locations and uh, incurring the expense of retrofitting these sensors uh, on a cable basis if you can get away with a wireless solution. So we've got three deployment programs that we're running at the moment in these sectors. One with uh, a medical device company, 
which uh, specializes actually in miniature medical implants for bioelectronics. Um, another one in the transport sector, and this is actually a, a, um, a cooperation that we've got with a company that started life as Sharp, but uh, in the wake of their takeover by Foxconn, was spun out and formed into an organization called Litricity. And this is where you recharge the cells using photovoltaic energy. And then finally, uh, our most recent announcement is with China's largest wind turbine manufacturer, a company called Titan Wind Energy. They're actually the fourth largest wind turbine company in the world. And this is where we're putting these cells into the turbine blades for condition monitoring uh, so that you can power strain gauges and predict when the turbine blades are going to fracture. So what does our roadmap look like? Um, what you see here actually is a mixture of the launched products that we have out in the market that are often going into these development programs we've just been talking about, the Stereax M250 and the P180, which we launched last year. Um, P180 having an even higher top temperature ability uh, up to 150 degrees C. And then some of the nearer term launches that we're expecting, millimeter scale devices that go into medical devices, higher energy devices for some of the industrial applications where you might need to power sensors that are a bit more power hungry, like image capturing devices. And then some of the ones that are a bit further out, like our most recent announcement of our large format development program, uh, Goliath, which we'll come back to in a few minutes. So this is actually uh, one of the real devices that we've built that uh, some of you actually have, have actually seen in operation. Um, this is uh, an industrial sensor. It measures temperature, measures light. Um, it also measures humidity, and it is powered by a small PV panel, which is about uh, the size of a one pound coin and that PV panel recharges two of the Stereax P180 batteries. They're the components with the X's on. You can see they look more like electronic components than the, they look like batteries. And then they actually power a small Bluetooth module uh, from a company called Regado, which sends a signal across a Bluetooth network, which is picked up by a central control system, which can then activate things like HVAC uh, and other uh, appliances. This is what our batteries look like when they come out of the production line. This is actually our pilot line down in Southampton. On the left hand side you've got a, a six inch wafer with an array of uh, P180 batteries on it. And on the right hand side, uh, which isn't quite a scale actually, that's a two inch wafer which shows a series of the millimeter scale prototypes which are supporting our next product launch which we expect later this year. You can see the, the small batteries, they haven't quite been etched out of this wafer yet. So effectively, um, they are uh, produced using a lithographic process. And then that whole wafer is diced up into the cells, which are then integrated into different products. So that's the hardware. A question we often quite rightly get is, well, uh, when does all of this convert into massive cash flows? Um, and uh, what, I, what I'm showing really is a series of plots of the uh, pipeline and its progress um, as we move through the sales process and flip towards that licensing model uh, that I was talking about earlier. So the, the blue uh, foundations of these columns are the non-disclosure agreements. And that's really second base. So when we interact with one of these OEMs uh, and they say to us, right, we've been through what's in the public domain. Can we just uh, have a bit more detailed information? Uh, what we do is we, we exchange that under NDA so that that uh, information is managed carefully by uh, our uh, potential partners. And then if that goes to plan and they say, well, that, that's working for us, we then send them some samples, which is what's covered by an MTA or a materials transfer agreement. And that comes with some obligations in terms of the testing that we want uh, these batteries to be put through and the reporting that we'd like back so that we know whether the cells have worked or not. And sometimes that then flips into a development agreement or a deployment agreement, and that's the yellow band. And that's really what those three programs uh, described that we were looking at earlier. 
And then at the top end, we've got our licensing proposals, and we've currently got three of those out there. Um, actually, uh, I'll be honest, the exact composition of those three proposals has changed over the last 12 months um, because not all of them go through into a licensing agreement. But that's uh, actually the foundation for what we expect to be our licensing <coughs> revenue going forward. So, uh, which are the sectors where we're seeing the most interest and whereabouts in the world are they? On the left-hand side, you've got uh, an industry analysis by sector. You can see about half of the batteries are going to medical device companies. Uh, about 30% are going to industrial players. And the remainders are going to uh, organizations known as IDMs, which are integrated device manufacturers. And they're sort of one step up the supply chain from the foundries where the basic batteries are made. So there are a number of organizations actually that are um, positioned in the semiconductor and MEMS uh, supply chains where they take components and start to integrate them into products which are then subsequently labeled by the OEMs and taken to market. And um, on the right hand side you see the geographic spread of that distribution and actually they are slightly correlated um, because most of the medical device companies are in the US. So that's why the US is a, a dominant geography for us. About a quarter of them are in Europe. And actually Europe is a really important geography for MEMS and sensor devices in general. So Bosch and ST, for instance, are the two biggest uh, MEMS device manufacturers in the world. And so Europe is, is definitely an important geography there. And then the rest are going out to Asia for manufacturing partners and, of course, some of the foundries that are located there. So, um, interacting with those foundries is really important because we want to make sure that we have a proper manufacturing supply chain when those licensing agreements come through. Um, and Steve, to his credit, has led uh, ISO 9001 certification that we were, we were awarded just before Christmas. So this allows us to port our quality processes onto those of our partners and exchange information that enables that technology transfer. Um, the reason that we have, in the last few months, added large format solid state batteries to our roadmap, uh, and those of you who've been following us for a number of years will remember when we first started out on this journey, we did indicate we would eventually get there. Um, the reason that we've now put it onto the roadmap as a, a firm product is really in response to significant interest from the automotive industry as regulation starts to kick in around the world for the adoption of electric vehicles as part of a uh, fleet percentage. People are looking to their own roadmaps. What can we power our vehicles with? Are we going to be stuck with uh, commoditized lithium ion batteries or are we going to start investing in the next generation of batteries with improved performance? Uh, and actually, in this country, there's a large incentive program that's known as the Faraday Challenge, which is a 400 million pound fund which is being deployed in this sector. Uh, and that's actually uh, stimulated a lot of activity of which we're part and that will be part of our news flow going forward in this year. Um, of course, we always keep an eye on strategic considerations for the company, making sure that shareholders can expect the best return. Um, so I will be the first to admit that our licensing timing is delayed relative to what we were expecting a couple of years ago. Uh, but we do have sustained partner interest, which I think that data bears out. Um, there's also strong macro interest in batteries and solid state batteries in general. Um, so the article in the FT that some of you may have read a couple of weeks ago is just one example of that. Hardly a week goes by without one of the broadsheets uh, running uh, an article that's profiling the whole industry. And we're also seeing increasing corporate support for our roadmap. So in terms of what you can expect going through this calendar year, uh, we're uh, posting bigger revenues. So uh, actually our interims, uh, we posted about a million in revenue relative to the 300,000 we'd posted for the same period in the previous year. So we expect to end uh, this year north of 2 million. Our, our current order book uh, is, uh, is set up for that. We're going to continue investing in the roadmap. 
We're going to finalize some of those manufacturing partnerships that we were just talking about. And also, uh, there'll be some increasing commercialization momentum with announcements around some of those deals that we're chasing. Thank you. Uh, could I ask what's the current cash position and do you have enough to see you through all these exciting programs as the revenues build up? Thank you. Sure. So the, the latest results that we published to the uh, end of October last year showed uh, cash on the balance sheet of just under four million. Um, we did get uh, half a million that came in the, the following week. So you sort of add that in to that stage. Uh, cash burn this year is looking at about uh, two and a half million. Um, and that obviously is, is being reduced as our turnover increases. Um, so plan A is that uh, we, we secure some of these licensing deals we're chasing. Uh, we get some upfront revenues associated with those and that, that sees us through. Uh, plan B, if it takes slightly longer, we've, we've had quite a lot of uh, corporate interest. So we'll, uh, we'll be assessing that. Um, and yeah, it's certainly an area that we keep uh, under close review. You mentioned ARM earlier on. Um, uh, you're not comparing yourself with ARM though, are you? Um, you know, ARM managed to infiltrate itself with the greatest American um, um, suppliers of mobile phones from Apple downwards. Uh, and the, the, the joint ventures that you have are not with American companies in general. Although you mentioned in medical field, you have some. Um, uh, are, you, are you aiming for the top, as it were, in, uh, uh, in, in the Internet of Things, or are you just a research organization on the fringes of uh, the main drive? Well, Please. we are. Yeah, <laughs> good question. Uh, I, I would hope that we're aiming for the top. Um, you know, ARM's first deal, I guess, was with Nokia. Um, of course, how times have changed. Uh, I would say that uh, some of the, the corporates that we've got MTAs with are, are the leading organizations in their sectors. Uh, many of them, as you've seen from that pie chart, uh, are American. Um, of course, a lot of the, the world's major corporates uh, are based in that jurisdiction. So uh, we have a, a dedicated business developer uh, who is American and is based over there and is responsible for pursuing those deals for us. And, uh, you know, we don't underestimate the importance of having some headline names. Um, what's your policy on managing currency risk? Um, we get most of our partners actually are, are comfortable in paying us in, in sterling. So um, we have most of our deals are in sterling, um, but we have taken a number of um, development works in, in dollar denominated because we have some dollar expenses. Um, but we're, we're able to sort of naturally hedge at the moment. Thanks, that was, that was very interesting. Um, d d d the, the, are you building relationships with, with the foundries and the um, c c corporates <laughs> in parallel? Um, and also, how, how, um, how far away is your product from being you know, or your products be from being used in 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 in, in commercialized products. Yeah. So um, the, actually, I think it's really important to establish relationships with both ends of the supply chain. So the OEMs on the one hand, and also uh, the the foundries and the IDMs on the other. And the reason for that, of course, is that it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So if you want an OEM to take a license. You've got to convince them that actually it's possible to manufacture your product at scale. And if you want to get a foundry interested, you have to convince them that there's an OEM that's waiting there to give them a big order so that they can fill their production lines. Um, so our approach actually is to, to work with both of them in parallel, uh, but to try and go to the foundries and the IDMs with an OEM partner and say, well, this organization wants to build this product you know, this is the market projection for how many of these devices uh, are going to be required in the coming years. Have you, the IDM, got the capacity and the appetite to be able to invest in uh, the equipment and the resources in order to fulfill that order? Uh, and, and that, at the minute, is working quite well for us. Um, 
So in terms of the maturity of our product and how far off it is from the mass market, I think uh, the timelines depend on which particular segment uh, that you choose, because actually the industrial deployments are more straightforward than the medical device ones. However, both sectors yield uh, licensing revenue to the company. And you know, in the early days, I expect us to ramp licensing income before we actually get to the royalties. As one of the earlier slides showed, it's probably realistically two to three years uh, between signing licensing deals and the royalties starting to flow into the organization. And actually, many of you will remember it, it took uh, many years before the, the royalty income that went into ARM was significant. You know, for many years they ramped revenue based on the issue of licenses. W will, you, will you generate income from the licenses before the royalties come through? Yes, that's and right. And will that be enough for you to wash your, uh, you know, to stop Our your faces. Yeah. <laughs> Steve? You yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, obviously the, the nature of the, uh, the amount of the licensing deal will depend on the application, the territory. We've got a sort of pyramid structure that sort of helps us define the, uh, the licensing values. Um, but typically we're looking at licensing fees in the order of sort of one and a half million dollars up front. Uh, and that obviously makes quite a difference to our, to our cash flow. Just very quickly and generally speaking, I mean obviously you've got these um, foundry people and the OEMs, specifically more the foundry people. They're gonna use your license to produce whatever it is nature of fact the license allows them to make. How much is the extra capital investment would they have to make? Or is it just a question of just changing the materials? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it depends a bit on what assets the foundry has already invested in. The best fit that we're seeing between the foundries and our organization are companies that have made compound semiconductors, which means that they've taken multiple materials and combined them in order to make devices because of course solid state batteries have got a mixture of different elements. And often we're finding that uh, foundries that have got that track record uh, are fairly easy for us to engage with. Just one very quickly, if I can do. Mm. You mentioned with regards to improvements in the batteries. Can I just ask, have you got the three-dimensional battery working yet? The three-dimensional battery? One of the batteries, one on top of another. All right. Yeah, so we've got those working in our labs. Uh, the secret of that one, though, is to get sufficient yield in our pilot line so that it's a fully qualified process that we can transfer into a larger organization. And that's going to be part of our news flow going forward this year. Graham, Steve, thank you very much indeed.